that means that there it is. That means that if you are not uh, okay with this, um, what do we tell pe people, Tony? Um, please, we don't want we don't want anybody not to be at the meeting, but we want everybody to be aware of that we are recording. Secondly, please. Oh, I was just going to say, and then so if you don't want to be recorded, the best solution is to turn off your camera, and so it'll just show your your name um, for the attendance. Thank you, thank you. Uh, number two. Please ensure your microphone is on mute so we don't get any background noises coming in. And number three is questions can be submitted using the chat feature at any time. We do welcome any and all chats to come in. And I do hear some, a little bit of background noises come in. Uh, I do ask that you look, look to your um, microphone to make sure it's muted. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, next are community agreements, and I'm going to stumble through this. Uh, Monica has asked that I, I do it in English and in Spanish. Uh, I have prepared this from Google Translate. Let me get it up here, and you may text me in the chat and tell me how Google got it wrong. But number one, stay engaged. Mantenerse como comprometido. Number two, speak your truth. D to Ferdan. Three, no fixing, sin fijación. Four, experience, experience discomfort, experimentar maestar. Next, take risks, toma riesgos. That's the hardest one for me. Uh, next, listen for understanding, escucha para ent entender. And finally, Expect and accept non-closure. Esperar y aceptar el no cierre. Um, we are all looking for, um, looking to take risks here. Um, understand that no fixing means that we're not looking for when someone um, says something, we're not looking to fix anything. We're just look, listening for understanding as you've probably heard before. Uh, and if there are any issues on the last one for expect and accept non-closure, uh, that's okay. That's perfectly okay. So, thank you for that. And uh, about us, uh, LLN is a business resource group. We thrive to provide Latinos and allies in state government, a place where they feel a sense of community, learn new things that help them in their professions and meet other fellow Latino state workers. Our vision is to connect and inspire Washington State's Latino workforce and leadership leaders of today and tomorrow. And our mission is through the power of connection, invest, inspire, and serve. And another important note here is that while we use the term Latino, uh, we wanna make this fully inclusive. So anybody who identifies as Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latinx, uh, Latin ampersand, Latinat, Chicano, or any other similar identifiers, we do don't want to exclude anybody. However, we do use the term in our name, uh, Latino Leadership Network. And uh, this is an important piece here, is that we want to uh, capture everybody that's here at the meeting. So please do uh, either scan the QR code there or in the chat function, there's gonna be a link to click on and please do uh, mark down that you've been here so we can collect that for o OFM. And Tony's just dropped that in the chat there. Yeah, it might, it might, if that doesn't work, let me know because um, we're, we're flying without our, um, our admin, uh, Noemi Silerzano Thompson, and she's really, uh, the, the brains of, of a lot of this uh, and the technical piece. I'm not sure that I, I copied it basically. Okay, so thank you, Curtis. Let me let me uh, hop on that. That coming up as a link, Tony. Oh, that's weird. Okay. We can work on it in the background and get that posted as soon as we can. Okay, I think I got it. So if you'll try that. Thank you, Steve, for doing the introduction. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> and, and that link we, works. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, so Steve said, um, oh, hi, everybody. I'm Tony Griego. I'm the uh, chair for the Latino Leadership Network. Uh, you might have heard Monica a moment ago. She's uh, our co-chair. Um, we, we, like I said, we, we, um, Noemi is, is an integral member of the team. And so uh, we're, we're uh, freaking it out as we go. Um, but thank you. Um, OK, so for today's agenda, um, so, and also if, if I will say, if there's something like if we're talking and you see, don't see the person or the slides or something like that, please let us know in the chat. Um, although uh, as, as Steve mentioned earlier, the chat is also part of the recordings somehow. Um, um, so, you know, be aware of what you write in there may be out there for, for the world to see. Um, so our agenda for today is um, we've covered the welcome. Um, we were going to cover some announcements of things going on we want you to be aware of, um, just in terms of uh, what we have going on, but also other things happening around the state. Uh, we are going to then introduce our new uh, executive sponsor, David Puente. Um, as, as you may remember, last month we celebrated our, our previous executive sponsor, Alfie, who, who I think I saw in attendance. Um, and David is going to be filling her, her boots. Um, which is, it feels appropriate because um, he is also now your director um, for your Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, let's see, and then as Vanessa said in the chat, it's really important that we capture your attendance numbers. Um, it's one of the things that we're, um, we report on for engagement and how well we're doing. Um, and then a way also to connect with y'all. Um, okay, and then, after we do our introduction um, with David, we're going to have a, a panel. We have three guests um, to talk about Afro uh, Latin culture and identities. Um, and then we'll, after we have that discussion, uh, I should say it's February, so it's Black History Month. And so that was um, why, why we wanted to feature them this month. Um, although they're fantastic people that I'd be happy to, to have at any, any time of year. Um, and then we're going to take some time to to uh, you know continue our goal of building community uh, with some charla or breakout rooms for for discussion. Um, they're they're light conversation topics, although if you really make connections and want to get deeper, you can. But um, we have some some uh, preguntas to to talk through. Um, okay, so I want to talk about some save the date. So so open up your calendar and put a, 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 a placeholder on your calendar. Um, first, I wanna tell you about um, in, in April, we've been working with uh, the Commission on Hispanic Affairs. Um, Maria Siguenza is the uh, executive director over there. And she reached out to us about um, partnering up for an event together. Um, so April 10th is Dolores Huerta Day in Washington state. And so we are going to be doing a lunch and learn on April 10th. It's a Monday um, to, to have a, a, um, again, a panel of guest speakers to talk about um, Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez. Um, you know, I wanna acknowledge that um, you know, they're historical figures and so they're not perfect. And so you know, that'll probably be part of the conversation as we, we, we discuss them. Um, but we're, we're looking to feature um, members of the Hispanic Caucus for Washington State. Um, in the past, uh, LLN has featured uh, Senator Rebecca Saldana and uh, Representative Lillian Ortiz Self. Um, so I'm, I'm, we're still working out who will be attending, but you know, we hope to, to get somebody along those lines as well as some folks from the community. Um, yeah, so we're really excited about that. That's gonna be April 10th. It's gonna be a lunch and learn event. So it'll be from 12 to, or almost on 12 to noon, but no, uh, 12 to one or noon to one uh, on that Monday. And it'll be a virtual event. Um, we're looking also to the future about uh, maybe doing an in-person event to, to celebrate together, um, but that'll probably be a year out. Um, I'll leave that to future LLM leaders to figure out, um, but we're excited to, to partner with Cha on that. Um, the other thing I wanna tell you to hold, put a hold on your calendar for is a bit further out, um, but September 23rd uh, is, is a Saturday and we have circled that for our Hispanic Heritage uh, Month kickoff event. Uh, 
we, we did an event this last September down at Miller Sylvania State Park in partnership with uh, State Parks, um, who are fantastic um, to work with and, and just great partners. And we've um, penciled in that date um, for this upcoming year. Um, now, so Saturday, September 23rd is a, a free admission day or parking day at State Park. So it's one of the reasons we selected the date. Um, and I, I want to also um, do some recruitment right now because we, we're gonna need people to help put that event together. Um, it, we're, we're looking again at Miller Sylvania State Park. We, if we have um, volunteers and somebody to lead it and, and to help us gather more resources, we'd love to do something also east of the mountains. So maybe in central or, or Eastern Washington, uh, I know that a lot of you attend th our, our meetings from throughout the state, and we we want to, um, you know, we want to be inclusive of everybody in the state, not just Olympia centric, um, because hey, we're a big state, um, and so, but we we will need help to make that happen. Um, we also um, would like to ask if if and we would also like to ask uh, if you are interested in helping um, us seek sponsorship because we, we do need, um, I mean, we, we, we were able to do, have the location because of state parks, but we also want to do things like provide entertainment, provide food. I mean, that's, let's be honest, that's what, what gets me to go to a lot of things is if there's, there's free food or food part options. Um, and so we want to be able to make it like a true celebration. And so we do need help um, seek, seeking sponsorship from state agencies. Um, uh, uh, so if you're if you're interested in either helping to organize um, on the west side or the east side, or or to um, help us in, in gathering sponsorship, um, please contact us at lln at um, I'll put that in the chat too. Um, that's our email contact address. Um, and, and even if you aren't ready to, to um, you know, lead a sponsorship drive or that sort of thing, um, we would appreciate, you know, if you feel confident or comfortable um, helping us connect to your agency leadership so that we can make a sponsorship request, that, that is also another way you can help. Um, I'll tell you to um, build um, our, our sibling BRG has uh, sent out sponsorship requests. So we, we do have um, work from them that we could crib as well as um, previous sponsorship work before. So um, you, know, you wouldn't be starting from scratch. So I hope I gave a good sales pitch with that. But again, save the date, April 10th, save the date, September 23rd. Um, we, these are, are, are exciting events um, and, and um, I don't know, it'll, it'll, it's gonna be fun. Um, okay, so next. Um, so last month, I told you about they, they had a placeholder for public service recognition awards. They've gone live. And so I want to encourage you all to, to get out there and nominate some of your coworkers, um, nominate your, your, a leader that's really made an impact at your agency or that you know of. Um, there's two specific awards or two, two awards, um, the extra mile form and the or the Extra Mile Award and the Leadership Award. And if you're new to, to um, state service, um, Public Service Recognition Week is in May and it's an event to, to honor all of you for the work that you do in, in providing um, and, and the work you do for our communities and for the public. And um, the, I, I, I I always feel like uh, when I talk to LLN members that we're, we're a humble group, um, we don't necessarily think of ourselves as, as award winners, um, but I'm, I know from experience from working with a lot of you and talking to you that you do great work, whether that's going the extra mile or, or stepping up into leadership roles, I really wanna encourage y'all to nominate somebody for these awards. Um, they're looking for uh, innovation around like techniques and methods, visionary thinking, a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, um, you know, contributions to state government, 
all those things. I know that LLN members um, are, are doing that work and deserving of these awards. And so if you, um, let's see, if you have your phone, you can do the QR code and it takes you right to the recognition um, form or I'm dropping the links in the chat. You can, um, you can go that route. Let me drop both of those in. Um, the nomination period also closes on the 26th, which is I think Sunday um, of February. So you're all seeing my screen uh, there. So um, get your nominations in quick. Um, yeah, please nominate someone you know. I need to get to work and, and nominate some folks myself, by the way. Okay, another thing to tell you about is um, on February 21st is Latino Legislative Day. Um, this is an, uh, an event organized by um, the Latino Civic Alliance. Um, and it, it's gonna be virtual. Uh, it runs from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then there's a, a, a special presentation and a Latino Civic Awards during the noon hour. Um, the the this is something that i want to i want you all to be aware of um so that you can either participate um or or learn about the different uh, legislation going on in state this is something though that i would advise you if you if you are going to attend um this is is um, outside of kind of the scope of regular business for the state and so you should probably take leave if you're going to attend um, and then you don't use your state resources to attend the meeting. Um, I've gone in the past, in the past this has been in person and I took a vacation day and, and went in person. So I didn't have to worry about, you know, what I was using to, to connect to the Zoom. Um, but it is important that you're aware around that, the, the ethics piece of this and, um, you know, again, use the state resources. Um, so please, if you're gonna attend, which, uh, um, or, or just check out what the agenda is, um, you know, be aware of, of that use uh, of your time and the state's time. Um, also, they have on February 22nd, a youth advocacy day. So I know um, a lot of y'all have kids and this is a good opportunity to expose them to the legislative process. Um, the youth advocacy day runs from 10 a.m. to 2, 12 p.m. on uh, the 22nd and is also a virtual event. And um, there will be a, a basic bill writing class, you know, explaining kind of the legislative process. So it's a good chance to get exposure. Um, you know, if, if you have a, a, a kiddo that is interested in government and all that sort of stuff, this is a good way to expose them. And then maybe, you know, let them know, hey, um, there's also a page program that happens at the legislature. So next year, during the legislative session, if they're interested in that, that's a good way to get involved as well. So, um, and then here's the link for the Latino Civic Alliance. The QR code also takes you there, um, but that's a, a direct link. Okay, um, I'm gonna tap in uh, Angela Arake, our, one of our wellness co-leads to talk about the employee assistance program for a moment. Are you ready, Angela? Thank you, Tony. Um, hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you today. This is an invitation for you to access the resources provided by the Washington State Employee Assistance Program. This is a free confidential program created to promote the health safety and well-being of public employees. They often support various issues such as depression, stress, addictions, anger, parenting, relationships, and grief and loss. More than 90,000 public employees have access to EAP services to help us address work and life concern. You can learn more about the employee assistance program by visiting their webpage. I I put in the link in the chat. There you're going to find, I don't know if I put the right link. Um, I'm going to read that, hold on. 
And then you will find a variety of options um, to access the resources and just to, to, to find counseling and more information. And additionally to that, I have this link for you to access their webinars. Thank you, Tony. All right, thank you, Angela. Um, and, and as I mentioned, Angela is part of our uh, meets our wellness committee. And so if you're interested in helping with efforts, um, you know, again, I, I dropped the, the email in the chat, but if, if you're interested, Angela is fantastic to work with. So, um, you know, that's an opportunity for y'all as well. Okay. Um, I think at this point now, I'm going to turn it over to Monica for a little bit to introduce our new executive sponsor, David. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, yes, it's my privilege that I get to introduce um, David Puente. He is our new um, executive sponsor, and we're all excited to have him. Um, a few dot points about Mr. Puente, he's the director of your Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, he is a US Army veteran and he began his state career in 1992. In 2017, he received the governor's Distinguished Management Leadership Award. And so I invite you all to give him a warm welcome in the chat. And I would like to introduce David Puente. Hola, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I apologize. I'm my passenger in a car on the way back from Fort Orchard. Uh, we just left the Washington Soldiers home where we were visiting with residents. So I just wanted to introduce myself as uh, you all know by now, I'm David Puente. You have my bio. Uh, for me, it's an honor to be a part of LLN now, sponsor. Years ago, I, Alfie, when we first started having conversations, about establishing the Little Latino uh, Leadership Network when we were meeting over at the Department of Health, uh, having the, the general conversation about creating the committee. Obviously, as we all know, work gets in the way. And uh, for me, it's a privilege to be here and give back and figure out how I can help this uh, group. Uh, and this employee resource group and, and giving back not only to the community, but to ourselves and state employees. So I'm more than willing to answer any kind of questions and have a conversation with any of you if you'd like. And I'll try to see if I can use the chat as well. Uh, but uh, I'm willing to, to chat about anything and everything. I'm pretty much an open book. Well, we have one question, one general question for you to share with the membership today, um, and that is how has working in state government changed since you started with the state? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, so I started back in 92, and I know when I first started, I was in Wenatchee, I, East Wenatchee. I started as a fraud, uh, a bilingual fraud investigator. First of all, as you all know, by looking at my bio, I was in the military, so I didn't have family here in Washington state. I moved, I took it as just another transition, another permanent change of duty station, um, moving to the state of Washington and started working for the agency, the Department of Labor and Industries. When I started at that particular time, I was sharing a cubicle. So if you can imagine the cubicle spaces that we have now, there was two of us in that little cubicle. Um, and the things that I would say that have changed is, there's a lot more opportunities to be able to succeed and grow within the career growth. It sounds like we have some bandwidth issues, David. So we are so losing sure some of your what audio. What I mean about that is I've always Okay, can you hear me now again? Yes, we have you back. Uh, can you tell me where I broke off or do I start over? <laughs> no, you don't have to start over. Um, it was about your state service and how you had started as an investigator and then we got some audio choppiness. Okay, um, so I'll continue with that. 
when I started as an investigator with the agency, one of the things that I was focused on is learning the job and learning the, my position in the agency. I also recognized that the work I was doing, I didn't realize that there was a huge Latino population in the state of Washington. I grew up in Florida as a migrant farm worker. So, and I used, we used to go up the East coast. So my uh, experience has been just following the tomato crop and row crops on the Eastern side of the U S I didn't realize there was a big population of agriculture in the industry itself. And then also, uh, a huge Latino population doing the work. I mean, I wasn't surprised because that's the community where I grew up at. Um, ultimately, I ended up moving to the Yakima Valley where a lot of that community reminded me of where I grew up. It's a town in Mockley, Florida, uh, where there was a lot of Latinos and African-Americans in the community. It was a low income area. But getting back to the state about what, they, what I've noticed of things that have changed is I think there's a lot more opportunities for us to grow and develop as leaders. I know when I first started, one of the things that I always challenged myself was is that I'm a lifelong learner. I always wanna to continue to learn and grow as an individual. And I also wanna to continue to support other individuals as well, and not only my community, but individuals around me that wanna be passionate about uh, learning and growing and helping others. Things have gotten better when it comes to a lot of the work that we're doing on diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging right now. Um, I think all of us can say, when, I know I can, uh, I guess I'll speak for myself. I shouldn't say that we all can say this. We've all experienced um, some type of discriminatory behavior or where you feel like you have to work harder, longer, smarter in order to succeed. And a lot of it is because of our core values of who we are as individuals and what La Familia has taught us about who we are as individuals and having to do more. But I think what I have noticed a change in within the state government, it's, it's about recognizing the individuals for the work that they do. And, it, and I know sometimes it's hard because you have to take that additional step. But I think as a state, we've gotten a lot better at dealing with the discriminatory behaviors that take place. I will say that there's still some pockets around like that. Um, my background is in uh, regulatory arena. So when I was in LNI, I did a lot of regulatory work. So I was a fraud investigator. Uh, I did a lot of work within DOSH, which is a division of occupational safety and health. And again, a lot of regulatory work. So I was working with the population base that was always taken advantage of or the vulnerable population, a lot of our community as well. And a lot of it is because we were just afraid of not understanding what the laws are, what our rights are as, as workers in this state. And I think for us, the thing that I've noticed within state government that's trying to change is to listen to the customer, to listen to their voices. Um, we all want to do the right things. And it's just about doing a lot more outreach and education to the community so that they understand what's um, their rights, what they're eligible for, and how to work within the system and the process. Um, those are just a couple of things that I know I've kind of rambled going back and forth. So I'll kind of open it up if there's any additional questions. Yes, we do have one follow-up question. How do you think our identity as Latinos can help us be impactful in our work for the state? I think for me, how I'll respond to that is, I don't think it matters the positions that you're in. I think we're all leaders in some sense of, of that word. We just need to figure out how we can influence. Um, the hardest thing, and I think Tony was talking a little bit about a little earlier in that, I know for me, it took me a long time to be able to speak up. Most of the time I was always uh, trying to work through others. And even though I had a seat at the table, I would wait and hesitate, wait till I listened to everybody and then I would speak. Or, or, or find opportunities to speak. I think now as Latinos that we have a voice at the table. When you have an opportunity to be at the table, depending on what that is, don't be afraid to speak your mind because we all have shared stories. People wanna hear stories and figure out how we can make those changes. We all have those. Uh, it's about how do we influence others, whether we're leaders in your by position or leaders in your roles, 
And I think it's state government, once you understand on how to make the changes within policy, within your own agencies, you have operating procedures, uh, best practices, things that we can focus on and provide input where we can make changes internally. But then if you ever get in a role where you're able to provide advice to try to make changes, whether it's a the RCW or influence our representatives, uh, whether it's locally or nationally, to be able to make changes at a higher level to talk about those areas. And it's getting better at telling the story. How can we connect? How can we make that story impactful to address the change that we're trying to make? Thank you so much for sharing that with us today, David. We appreciate it. And I will echo um, that sentiment around us using our voices and using our stories. Um, I, I had a mentor several years ago also share that people don't know what's going on and what you're capable of if you don't share what's beyond what they can view in your workday. So we have many talents and we're multifaceted. So thank you so much for sharing here thoughts today. Thank you so much for carrying on the Latino Leadership Network as our executive sponsor. We're very grateful that you've come to take over for Alfie and we miss Alfie. So if you happen to see her, <laughs> let her know <laughs> that she is missed and that you're doing a great job. So yeah, I, I will. I'll let her know. I'm sure I'll talk to her sometime this week. So muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tony, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Sorry, it took me a minute to find the mute button. Um, <clears throat> thank you to David for, for, for talking to us on the road. Again, that's dedication. Um, same sort of de dedication we, we saw with Alfie. Um, Okay, so give me just a moment to get back to the presentation. Okay, um, can you all see the, the slides again? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Okay, so it's February and February is uh, Black History Month. So um, that's part of what we're gonna be talking about today, but I also wanted to take a moment to um, share with you what, uh, again, our sibling uh, business resource group, uh, BUILD, which stands for Blacks United in Leadership and Diversity, is, um, has going on. Um, this Friday, they have a, an event that is both it's a hybrid event, so it's both in person, but also online. Um, and it runs from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Um, let me drop another uh, link in the chat for registration. Um, you do need to get your registration in either today. I, 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 would, try, I would get it in today because um, I believe it closes on the 15th. Um, and it's going to be located in Tacoma, Washington. Um, do, and then they have another uh, uh, event next week as well that'll be virtual. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so next, um, let's see. Monica is actually going to be reading a, a statement from. Um, our other co-lead for the Wellness Committee, uh, Zenaida. Thank you, Tony. Um, yes, I am going to be reading this on behalf of Zenaida, and I wanted to be able to go off camera so that you can have um, her picture as these are her words on just reading them. I'm also just taking a second to pull them up. There we are. From Zenaida Rojas, before I start, I want to offer a trigger warning for gun violence and death. Recently, Tyree Nichols was murdered by police officers. This was really hard and heavy to accept and hear. And as I am 
speaking as someone who is lighter skin and Latina, it was exhausting for me to hear that something like this happened once again. I wanted to bring this up because I want to find out how to show true allyship to the Black community during these hard times. I'm not sure what this is supposed to look like, but I don't think it's the sole responsibility of the Black community to have conversations while they are hurting and healing, while many of us are. Of course, if and when there are movements that are being organized by Black leaders, we should listen and uplift their voices to truly understand and hear them, to collaborate and celebrate as needed for our communities. I want to ask a few questions that I hope we think about. One, are there any ideas to encourage a conversation between and amongst the Latino community to stand in solidarity with our Black and Indigenous brothers and sisters? Even if it's having conversations amongst ourselves, dealing with our own anti-Blackness that we have within, as well as talking about the very real reality that machismo, anti-Blackness, and the patriarchy are prevalent within our communities, not in a way that bashes or brings people down, but with an intention to heal and uplift, to unlearn and relearn many things that have been unconsciously and consciously embedded into us. I want to finish by saying Happy Black History Month May Tyree Nichols rest in power. May all of the Eric Garners, Breonna Taylors, George Floyds, Tamir Rices, and many more rest peacefully and in power. At this time, Tony and I would like to offer a brief moment of silence. Thank you all. Tony, I'll turn back to you. Thank you, Monica. And I wanna say, I know she's, she wasn't able to be here because um, like all of you and all of us, uh, she also has a day job working for the state. Um, but Zenaida, um, I wanna say thank you for um, sharing your words and, and thoughts. Um, you know, the, 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 they, they really bring it home. Um, so um, next, though, we have a, a guest panel that um, we're going to be featuring. Um, I want to share with you, too, last year, um, we also had a, a Black History Month event um, and, and featured some um, videos and resources that we shared. These are available um, on our YouTube site. Um, one of them that, that um, we shared that we didn't watch during the meeting um is a a red table event on facebook with the uh Estefan family the gloria stefan um that talked about colorism and you know racism within the latino community um and, and i would encourage you to to look up the either google it um red table Estefan family um or, or you know go back and watch our our youtube video on our, our from last year's meeting, because um, it is a, a really um, eye-opening video and, and um, you know an important conversation for us to all be having. Um, with that, I want to welcome our, our guest panel. Um, we have three LLN members who have graciously stepped in to, to speak and um, uh, I don't know, they're, they're uh, they're they're fantastic people, so I'm always excited to to have opportunities to to um, share them with y'all and then just to, to chat with them in general. Um, so I'll do a, a brief intro and then we'll we'll, we'll welcome them in. Um, so first we have uh, Larry Delgado. Um, Larry is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager over at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, Larry is a uh, a 20 year career veteran with the um, US Army. He's also chair of the Veterans Employee Resource Group. So he's now leading another business resource group himself um, and doing great work over there. Um, 
Yeah, Larry's just a really impressive guy. I'm always happy to, to work with him. Um, he's, you, you, you've, you, you probably got the, the bio for him with all of the different uh, achievements he has and certifications. Um, I learn a lot whenever I talk to him, so I'm really happy to have him. Uh, next, then we also have Indira Melgarejo. Um, Indira is also a, a, a brilliant person that uh, um, first got to work with because of LLN um, before she'd even started with the state. Uh, she was here making things happen. Uh, Indira is the business resource group coordinator over at the Office of Financial Management. So she's a key ally and helpful in, in just getting all this work done. Um, Indira is originally from Venezuela, uh, where she was a tenured professor and clinical child psychologist. So she's very smart. Um, and yeah, just, and again, I'm really happy to get to, to have her here. Um, and then third, we have Jennifer Samprelli, who uh, works as an administrative assistant over at the Department of Services for the Blind. Um, I'm really happy to, to, to get a chance to meet her and work with her. Um, she is uh, works with our admin, Noemi Solerzano Thompson. And um, you know, if, if Noemi says somebody's uh, brilliant, then I, I, you know, they have to be because uh, she's. She's pretty picky, um, and she, but I hold her, her opinions in very high esteem. Um, oh, Jennifer um, was originally born in New York City. Um, she's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm reading, uh, I'm, I'm stumbling a little bit here. Uh, but um, yeah, she's got a lot of different experience, um, 30 years of experience across different industries. And, and she was telling us earlier, hey, she's an entrepreneur, so she makes things happen. And, and I'm excited to hear perspectives from her as well as her experience. Um, we'll get into to some of her, her, her bit a little bit further. So I don't want to you know, do any spoilers. Um, I do want to share with you, though, I mentioned Larry is the chair of the Veterans Employee Resource Group. And so I wanna share with y'all, um, hope he doesn't mind. Um, Virg is uh, putting together a, a, an agency hiring event at the end of March over at Joint Base Lewis McCord. Um, and I wanna share a link to that for y'all um, to either um, share with your agency and help promote, or if you know of somebody that is about to leave, um, military service and looking to transition, um, tell them about the event because, um, you know, veterans are, they bring a, a different kind of skill set. They bring a different kind of experience and um, the, their key, um, I don't know, you'll, you'll meet Larry. He'll make a good example of, 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 of what it's like to work with a veteran. And so I just wanted to make sure that we advertise that event and share that with you all. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing the slides so we can see everybody a little bit easier. And then we've got some questions we're going to go over. And um, if you have questions, um, you know, feel free to either raise your hand or put it in the chat, and we'll try and um, get to all the questions from y'all as well. Um, but first, I got to find how to stop sharing this thing. <clears throat> all right, there you are. Hey, I can see y'all. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, Let's see. Let me pull them up though. Oh, um, so let's see. Uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> Jennifer, Larry, or, or Indira? I'll go. All right, Jennifer, thank you for jumping in. Um, so um, first of all, thank you for, for being here and, and, and welcome. Um, so let's kick it off with, you know, do you mind sharing, uh, telling us a little bit about your identity as a, you know, a Black Latino or Afro Latina? How, how, how do you identify? What does that mean to you? Sure, so um, just let me start with, uh, thank you. I'm very, very honored to be here. 
Um, and you're right, Noemi is ridiculously picky. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's, uh, uh, I, I got a real big job ahead of me because I know she's going to be watching this video. Um, so I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I would like to, if it's okay with you, um, my assignment, as I understood it, I was given three questions to answer. And what can I say? I'm a little bit of a overachiever. So I really answered the questions. Uh, I would like it if it's okay, uh, I wanna go, I wanna answer the question in its entirety before we have any questions. There's a lot to unpack. So if you could put your questions in the chat or write them down, and then I promise we can unpack everything because I'm gonna squirrel out and we're gonna jump around and it's gonna be crazy. So my first question was, what does your identity as a black Latina mean to you? I have never, been asked this question before. My initial response was, I don't know. I'm from New York City where people look like me and feel like me, they're everywhere. Um, so the three questions that you guys did want me to answer, it took me down such a rabbit hole of self reflection and, and introspection. So, um, Today, I'm going to speak my truth. And I'm here with nothing but love and light and laughter in my heart. So please give me grace. If I use antiquated language or ideas, I, I'm still learning, okay? Um, so being a Black Latina means to me that. Okay, Tony, now's your cue for the first picture. Being a Black Latina means to me that I I'm a Unicornosaurus Rex. Go, Tony. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's okay if we can't get to it, no worries. Um, we had a really cute picture of a unicorn T-Rex hybrid. There we go. So what we're looking at right now is a picture of a T-Rex that is rainbow colored, that has a unicorn wielding a fairy wand. And he says, be a unicornosaurus rex in a field of unicorns. That is me. Get ready for that next picture, Tony. So... Being a Black Latina means to me that I am a creature unlike any other to behold, and you're lucky to get to know me. Tony's gonna come up with that second picture. I know you guys can see my face, but we're talking about origin stories. So here you go. Me, baby Jennifer Zamprelli. <laughs> okay, now, um, what else does being a, a Black Latina mean to me? Uh, it means that it is exhausting being brown and Black Google for my coworkers and actually all of humanity in general. Um, people who aren't used to being told no get very put out when you tell them, no, you cannot touch my hair. <laughs> Don't ask about my hair. And if you really feel like you need to make a comment, be like, Hey, Jennifer, looking good today. And just keep on trucking. <laughs> um, and please don't just reach out and do it anyway, because when I swat your hand away, you don't get to cry assault. True story. Um, last but not least, this is the last picture I would like Tony to pull up. And I promise I won't bother you with any more visuals. But I didn't know how else to put this how I show up versus how I am received. So what we're looking at is too much and never enough divided by being black and Latina equals one big fat identity crisis. <laughs> so that is the first, um, a little bit of the first part of me. Now, 
what Tony was trying not to spoil with spoilers, if you did not read the bio before you came to this meeting, is that I'm going to hit you with a plot twist. Um, I can't answer this question of what my identity as a Black Latina means to me without disclosing a third piece of my pie chart. I am a transracial adoptee. For those of you who do not know what transracial adoptee means, it means that you are of one race and you are raised it up in another. Um, my Italian and Irish adoptive parents, they thought it would be better to just not talk about race at all. Um, I actually learned that I was a different race when I was 13 years old by accident. Uh, they told me that I was just better at keeping my tan in the winter than my other adoptive siblings. Yes, it's okay to laugh for people who are laughing. These are funny things. We don't have to be so serious. <laughs> um, on my 21st birthday, I went to the New York Foundling Hospital in Manhattan and I acquired my non-identifying information. Um, the paperwork stated that my mother was of Puerto Rican descent and that my father was of Puerto Rican and possible um, African-American or Black descent. Uh, possibly? Definitely. Um, some believe that identifying as a Black Latina is a personal choice and others argue it has more to do with a person's physical traits such as their skin color or their hair texture. Um, here's how I understand this information. Being Latinx is an ethnicity, a way to define the culture that you relate to based upon where your family is from. Your race is more closely associated with your physical appearance. Deep down inside, I knew I was Black. I knew because of the way the outside world, out the world outside of my adoptive family treated me. When you are a child, your parents are God. And who was I to question God's explanation as to what's happening? Um, when I would ask my parents, why do people call me the N-word and tell me to go back to Africa? They would say, you know, the world's just crazy and I need you to ignore it. Welcome to parenting advice in 1976, 1985, and 1990. These are different times. We live in a different world. Context is important, okay? So that's question number one. I know there's a lot to unpack. Question number two, as a Black Latina, you live intersectionality. What does that mean to you in your everyday professional life at Washington State? Um, I offer a unique experience into the Black and Latinx. Um, perspective. And it can be at times a little bit more difficult to feel belonging because of that uniqueness. Henceforth, the Unicornosaurus Rex. Um, microaggressions, racism, prejudicial treatment, these are all things that I, I've experienced. Um, there have been times I have been privy to inappropriate conversations about Black people or uh, Latinx, because the person I'm speaking to took one look at me and then they decided who I was. Um, then I have to explain my Latinaness or my Italianness, and it just leads to a lot of code switching. Um, again, how I show up versus how I'm received. It's a daily box of chocolates. Um, who we are in our professional lives isn't always who we are in life. Um, you've been listening to me speak for a few minutes now. And when we're in a meeting, when we're conducting business, when I'm at work, this is exactly how I sound. But if you were a member of my family or you were one of my peeps, <laughs> I don't sound nothing like this when I talk to me and mine, because if I was using my lead them those and one, two trees, nobody would be able to understand anything that was freaking saying. It's crazy. So to look at me 
you're like, hmm, maybe she could be Rosie Perez's cousin. I don't know. But she sounds like she fell out of an episode of The Sopranos. I don't understand what's going on here. Two plus two does not equal four. It does not compute. Error, error, error. Being a unicorn is Unicornosaurus Rex is not all rainbows, kittens, and puffy white clouds, but most days it is. I have the ability to make everyone I know come, everyone I know when I come into contact with comfortable, um, regardless of any isms, race, class, pick your ism. Um, and it's one of my greatest superpowers. And I believe it's one of my greatest superpowers because I was raised in a white household. And that helped me with my understanding of that culture. And last but not least, um, question number three was, what do you want folks at LLN to know about Black Latino culture and identity? And so I took this as bullet points because I had so many things I wanted you guys to know. So um, here we go. Um, the term Black, Latinx, or Afro-Latinx are descendants from the Caribbean or Caribbean, I've heard of both ways, <laughs> and Latin America with African roots. Um, from Brazil to Puerto Rico, there are hundreds of hair textures and skin colors and combinations. Um, most people are unaware that um, Black Latinx face uh, the similar struggle of our Black and African American sisters and brothers when it comes to racism. Um, stigmas and stereotypes of men, for many women, proclaiming themselves as Black Latina is a direct challenge to the notion that Latinas can't also be Black. Uh, for me to identify on a form, for example, let's say the census, the US census. To identify correctly, I need to check both the Hispanic or Latina box and the Black or African American box. But as it stands right now, that form does not allow me to do that. Um, I'm forced to choose one or the other. And it keeps us in a nice, neat box for them. And being a Black Latina is not an or. It's not or, it's an and. Um, according to the US Department of Labor, Latinas make up the largest work group of the female workforce. 16% of the labor workforce, more than 12 million Latina women. Black Latinx pay um, in comparison to our counterparts, our male white counterparts is 57 cents to the dollar. 57 cents to the dollar. Um, and the pay inequity stems from two or more points of identity. And it's it, that increases the experience of oppression. Um, now we're gonna talk about hair. Women of color have always been told that their hair wasn't professional enough or neat enough for the workplace. Um, we have always been held to the white European beauty standards. Um, if we wanted to be gainfully employed, um, there have been cases by black workers um, alleging discrimination for natural hair that go more than 40 years past. There have been rulings on both sides of this argument and it's created a lot of, of tension and, and uncertainty with, with courts and, and other um, governmental entities ruling on both sides. Um, natural hair is a civil rights issue in the workplace. And so I'm gonna wrap this up with one last thing that I wanted you guys to know. I know I've been talking a lot, but I can't help it. I, I, need, I wanna talk about one of my sheroes. Um, Ursula Haleria Celia de la Caridad Cruz Alfonso. That's as Spanish as I get. <laughs> also known as Celia Cruz, the queen of salsa. 
The U.S. Mint is honoring Celia Cruz through the American Women Quarters Program. For those of you who don't know Celia Cruz, you're living under a rock, and I need you to go Google her because she is an amazing megastar. Um, she's earned 23 gold records, four Grammys, um, and a partridge in a pear tree, Lifetime Achievement Awards. Um, her magic of Latin music is undisputed. Um, Celia Cruz is the first Black Latina to appear on U.S. currency. This is outstanding. It's a great start. We have a really long way to go. Um, thank you for your time and wanting to get to know me. And fire away. I'm all yours with the questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, you're getting a lot of love for Celia Cruz in the, the chat. Um, so <laughs> I, I um, yeah, I, I thought I, I was laughing a little bit earlier because um, your parents, um, <laughs> yeah, I know. We're phrasing know. it. It's 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 an interesting one. I and I, I think I shared with Jennifer before the meeting started that um, our family is a transracial adoptee family. I'm Latino. My wife is white, and our son is uh, was born in Uganda, so um, he's uh, American Ugandan. And you wouldn't believe the bullshit people say to you. And I I, I use that term. Apologies. My wife will give me a hard time for 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 swearing in our meeting today, but you know, that's the word we've used with our, our son is when people, you know, talk like that, it's, or say those things to you, it is, you got to use the word that's appropriate for, for racist bullshit. And so, um, yeah, it, um, so thank you. I will come back. I want to give space to everybody um, to ask questions too, but thank you so much. It, really appreciate you speaking and um, sharing with us and it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm going to tap our, our next uh, um, panel members and then we'll come back to Jennifer with, with questions from the group. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, um, so Larry or, or Nira, which one of you wants to follow up? Jennifer, it's pretty little, a tough act to follow. Well, I just wanted to say that, you know, I am, you know, so thankful for Jennifer and her story and truly appreciate her being here. And I am so vested in, in the stories and I hope Indita doesn't hate me too much, but I want to um, give her the, the floor and pass the, the virtual mic to her. Thank you, Larry. That's so kind of you. And um yeah, yeah, uh, it's hard to follow Jennifer. And I am, you know, probably because I'm getting a little worried about talking, I'm getting hot too. So <laughs> I'm going to lose my pashmina. <laughs> okay, um, I, when, um, when we were emailing about the questions, right? Um, full transparency, I asked Tony, hey, Tony, I cannot answer the same questions, you know, that you gave uh, Jennifer and Larry. And, and because my experience, I, ca I say I cannot talk as a, as a black individual in the US, right? So I wanna put that there. And then uh, very gracefully, Tony, you pivot the question. So thank you so much for, for pivoting the question. So I have a slightly different set of questions. Being the, the first one is, how would you describe Black or Afro-Latin identity in Venezuela? Right, so Venezuela, where it come from, there is a Black in my back. Um, so I, I want to answer this question in two parts. One is the identity, and the second is how I see the expression of identity, right, in my country. So Afro-Venezuelans are designated by Spanish terms, so there are no words of African derivation use in this term, right? Then the term Afro-Venezolano is used primarily as an adjective. For example, folklore Afro-Venezolano. But the common term of what we in general refer to is as negro, right? Negro is the most general term on reference to speak of people by dark skin. And then you have gradients, right? Or um, yeah, gradients. So negro is the most common. 
Um, and then moreno, so refers to darker skinned people like me. So all my life I was, you know, labeled as, or label or I label myself, I don't know what comes first, right? Uh, uh, morena. <laughs> and then mulato, that refers to light skinned uh, people. And mulato is like, you know, that mix of European and African heritage. At the end, Venezuelan people are mostly mestizos, right? Because we are a mixture of African descent, indigenous origin, uh, indigenous people mm -hmm. and, and, and white. So we are a mixture, right? That word, um, um, like when you say moreno or negro, is more if, depending on the group of people that you are, if you are the, in my household, like in my, my mom, dad, and brother, I was the negrita, right? The little black. My brother was the catire or the blondie. But when I went to my grandma's house, my uh, older cousin, he was darker than me. So he was a negrito and I was just Indira. So the, I didn't have anything <laughs> special, <laughs> right? So now I'm gonna go to, how do I see that expression and identity? So how is a black culture in, in my country, how is it being Negro in Venezuela, right? How did you see it? So you see it in that cultural expression, in the religious ceremonies, in the art, in the music, in the tambores, the calixo, the merengue, the dance and the costume, right? Um, most of uh, the, the culture, um, depending in the region of Venezuela that you are, so you dance in a certain way that in another part, like in the Caracas or you know, is, it doesn't exactly apply. Um, so one of the best tales, uh, best known tales in Venezuela, you know, like saying your, you know, the fairy tales um, that I was raised with um, were from the Afro-Venezuelan oratory. By then it was an Afro-Venezuelan oratory. It was just the tales that you learn. Those are the tales of Tío Tigre y Tío Conejo. Tío Conejo, Uncle Rabbit. Tío Tigre, Uncle Tiger. And Tío Conejo, who managed to outwit Tío Tigre. Right? He was, he was a little one, but he was always ah, more fast. Wit. Right? That wit. That, yeah, that, 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 that Tío Conejo always has. So that was part of how we learned to be as Tío Conejo. Then you also see in that religious practice that uh, were adapted or in that mixture, right? From the uh, Catholicism, for example, drumming and dancing, which figure in celebrations of patrons or saints, right? Uh, we have um, religious ceremonies like uh, Los Diablos del Yare or Las Fiestas de San Juan, where what you do to add to adoration is through dancing, right? So, and those are variations of form from the African ancestor worship. And lastly, is the our major religious belief system, right? We have brujería or witchcraft. We have um, brujos or sorcerers, you know? We have the, the in, you know, there is the del daño, el mal de ojo, or the evil eyes. So all of these are things that are part of our culture as part of how we are raised. And the curanderas or these sorcerers are, so, are sought for their knowledge of herbal medicines and which are used both in against illness and also against mal de ojo or daño or evil eye. So in many parts of my country, these healers uh, are sometimes called ensalmadores and in particular respected for their ability to divine the future as well as to find lost objects and people. So sometimes a person is experiencing an, an illness and they first go to the curanderas before going to the the European <laughs> model of medicine, okay? Um, and then I have two more questions, but I want to pause for a minute because, you know, I, I wanna hear from Larry. 
<laughs> I went up past about 10 to you, Larry. <laughs> so we can do a little back and forward here. Thank you, Indira. Um, and I'm, I'm just so enthralled with all the stories and just so, so thankful to be part of this discussion and appreciate Tony for reaching out and inviting me into the space. Uh, and, you know, as I was pondering the questions that were provided to us, and, you know, uh, <laughs> I think the, the, the benefit, the pleasure, the value of, you know, identifying as a, a African Latino um, is, and, and the first question is, tell us about your identity and, and what it means to you. So just a couple of stories to tell you uh, of my experiences growing up in South Florida, um, went to, was raised in a predominantly Hispanic black neighborhood. Uh, my, uh, all my teachers that I can remember were either black or Latina, which uh, I think helped shape and, and formulate my um, outlook in life. So at a very early age, I was very appreciative of, of, of both of these cultures. Um, and at that time there was, you know, some colorism still is, um, but um, I remember very distinctly after I had joined the service and, and I was stationed in North Carolina um, with the 82nd Airborne Division. And, and one of my um, non-commissioned officers, um, black woman um, uh, and she was my superior. And I remember one day we were talking, I, I can't remember what happened. Um, I said something and she looked at me um, and she says, Larry, you're not black. I'm like, my last name is Delgado and you've, you've heard me speak in Spanish, right? But to um, Jennifer's point that um, identity crisis is real, right? Is the having to choose between one or the other. And what I've come to realize is that um, I love all aspects of what makes me, me, right? I can go to any cookout and be just as comfortable as I can go to any quinceañera and dance merengue, y salsa, right? Uh, I can, I'm, I'm hip hop and I'm also bachata, right? Uh, so it's, uh, I'm cumbia and, and I'm rock and roll, right? I'm all of it. And I think that kind of having a foot in both worlds kind of is such a value, such a benefit um, to being able to be adaptive and feel comfortable and, and feel the pain and the trauma of, of both of those cultures and, and how they, they collide uh, in the United States. Um, being again in, in South Florida, we have Goombe, Puerto Rican Day Parade, Calle Ocho, we have so much diversity in there, and yet there's so much division as well, right? So when we talk about, you know, my identity as a, as a Black Latino male, um, and I remember very early in the age, my brother was darker skinned than I, and I used to hear people, he can't be your brother, he's Black and you're not, right? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's, of course he's my brother. So what being a, a, a Black Latino means to me, it, it means everything, right? It, it, it means that I can navigate these waters and, and appreciate the value that, you know, these groups come and, and bring, right? And it's, I've never once, you know, and, and, and Jennifer, kudos, my wife's from Brooklyn, you know, I can navigate through the streets of New York, go back down to South Florida, go to South Carolina and not skip a beat, right? And, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, we miss when you know, we talk about you know, the, the intersectionality of us as, as human beings and how my multiple races you know, converge. And I did my ancestry, found out that I'm 11% Nigerian, 70% Mesoamerican and 9% uh, and, uh, um, Middle Eastern. So I think that you know, being that and being able to kind of um, share my experience with those. I was at Fort Bragg and I, you know, we had the special operations museum. So every time my brother or my family members came to Fort Bragg to visit me, I would take them to the special operations museum. So I, I'm going there, my brother in tow, his wife and, you know, my wife and my kids and, and this, this caretaker at the museum runs up to me. He's like, hey, young man, hey, young soldier, I got the absolute best, you know, display for you. And I'm like, oh, cool. You know, I, you know, I come here all the time. 
he walks me over to this display and he says, look here, son, the triple nickel, the first all African-American uh, unit in the army. I'm like, okay. At that point, I didn't, you know, for whatever reason, um, and, you know, I kind of didn't appreciate that side of, of, of my life, right? Um, unfortunately, growing up, you know, um, hearing from my mother, who I love dearly, um, hay que mejorar la raza, right? We have, to, we have to better the race. What does that mean? Clear eyes, blonde, you know, blue eyes, green eyes, straight hair, blonde hair, right? You got to do that. And I remember very early that I had a crush on my neighbor, Nicole. I still remember her name. And I came home and my wife's like, my, my mom was like, you can't, you can't be friends with her. I was like, why? I was like, because she's black. And I was like, but I like Nicole, right? And I think even there at that young age, um, kind of set the stage for how I was going to progress as an, as an individual. Even when I had my mother, who I loved dearly, telling me that I can't hang out with this girl that I'm crushing on, right? Hardcore crushing on, uh, that I can't be friends with her. And I think fast, fast forward 30 plus years, that I'm like, now it makes sense, right? Even then, you know, unknowingly, I appreciated where I came from, right? Uh, this convergence of, of these things. So I don't want to ramble, but that's my experience, you know, and what it means to be, you know, a Black Latino male and, you know, being out there and serving my country for the 20 years that I did and, and having partnerships with, you know, my best friend who now is, is a brother to me and I'm the, you know, the godfather of, of you know, his kids um, and they just happen to be black, right? It's just one of those things. Um, and the pain and the suffering that we went through through multiple deployments and having lost friends in the service, I think just, you know, there's the family you're born with and, and the family that, that you make. Um, and for some reason, I've always gravitated towards my African side. And, you know, people would tell me, don't you get upset that always people are always confusing you for being black? I said, no, if anything, I, I wear that as a badge of honor, right? As if you're gonna you know, uh, lump me in for lack of a better term with the people that have been oppressed for hundreds if not thousands of years and still continue to rise to the top and still continue to get over these obstacles that are laid in front of them. I was like, no, why would I be embarrassed about that? I lean into that, I love that, you know, to be, uh, part of a, of a race of people that continue to rise above the, as uh, Tony's just so eloquently said, the bullshit, right? And, uh, and, and, and continue to grow and, and, and be strong. So uh, I'll just pause there and, and, and hand, it, hand it back over to, to, the, to the other members. Yeah, Larry, when I, I hear you talking, right, I think um, something that I want to go with is um, one of the, the questions that um, you, you posted, Tony, right? And, and the question is, how did your shift in location, um, country, impact or shift how you view your personal identity? Right. So how is it that me, you know, moving to the USA about five years ago changed that personal identity? And um, Jennifer and, and Larry, you mentioned about the identity crisis, right? When at first um, um, Noemi approached me, I say, I don't know how. How can I talk about this? <laughs> you know, how can I talk about this this topic? And um, and I, I can, and I have a, a, this, this is why, you know, um, to need Taylor the, 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 the question. So in my case is, as many, many of you might have experienced, I don't know, but I became a Latina when I decided to apply for a, a permanent residency in the US. So I didn't become a Latina until I moved to the US and then I decide to live in the US, right? So here I was almost five years ago, consulting with a lawyer about my paperwork. <laughs> and then, you know, I go and I and say, what did I put here in race? I don't know. I don't have that question. In my country, we don't have that question. What is your race, right? We don't have that question. So Morena or Brown is not there. And she say, oh, put, put white. 
you are white. And I must say, it doesn't feel right. Right? It, it feels weird uh, to feel, you know, to be labeled as white. I do know that, you know, especially with this not so much sunny. I, I, I lose part of my time, but I was like, I'm not white, right? So uh, fast forward later on, the more I learn about race and ethnicity in the US, the more I learn about colonialism and decolonization in the US and in my own country, it all, you know, start to click. It definitely, I am not white. You know, I have been Morena all my life, or maybe brown. So, but how, how do I answer the question from the census? Or how do I go to a doctor and I have to fill out, you know, what is your race? So I am white, I am black, and I am indigenous. Okay, I cannot put indigenous, right? Because I need to have ties too. But then I can say I am black, and I am white, and I am Latina, right? That's how my personal identity shift from Venezuelan to Latina to Afro-Latina. And that makes sense is here, right? If, if that makes sense here in the US. It makes sense here in this, in this uh, room or, or, or no room, no, the bigger room, the, the country. And it makes also sense to me to find that identity that it was more than, you know, or brown or Latina or white or black. Um, it allowed me to be and be, not just be proud, but, you know, let my hair grow and be this cross, right? All my, before I moved here, everything was like a straight hair. Right? And as much as fast as I can be. Now I'm, every time there is sun, I'm like, Please, I need my real color to come back. <laughs> um, yes, it, it, it makes sense for me and it makes sense in my heart too. So back to you, Larry. Yeah, and I think one of the things, you know, and like it's to, to your point, Indeed, I was craving that sun, right? Even I was having a conversation with my brother the other day. He's like, man, you're really pale. I was like, we don't get any sun out here, brother. I was like, but if I go to South Florida, give me five minutes in the sun and it's it's over, right? But I think that part of, you know, just being, and, and I think you said it as being in this space, right? I crave this. I crave the 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 all the colors. I crave all the races. I crave all the experiences. This is my comfort zone. So I don't understand how, um, you know, we're in this point in, in, in time and space in, in, in this in this country where it's just like so divisive. I'm like, that's that's foreign to me, right? That's alien to me. I'm like, no, I'm like, this is this is my comfort zone. This is my this is my quote unquote norm. And, and when I don't have this, when I don't, I don't have like the beauty of all the, the shades of colors on the screen, I was like, I feel like I'm missing out. You know, I feel like I need to be with mi gente, with my people, right? Be it both Black and Latino, uh, and even even white, right? My my daughter is is engaged to to a, a, a white uh, man, and you know we bring him home, and we have conversations, candid conversations about you know how you know she's experienced life, you know being uh, Afro Latina herself, and it's just you know it's like it's again like I put in, in in the chat, it's it's one love, it's like the music, it's the culture, it's the food, it's 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 the dress is just like being able to, you know, and I find myself now and more often um, being very selective of the, of the, of the media that I take in. Like I used to go in this, into, into YouTube and I used to watch whatever's on YouTube, but now I'm just like, you know what, bump that, you know, I'm finding uh, um, YouTubers that are, are YouTubers of color, right? And I'm and I'm focusing on those YouTubers and giving them clicks and give and, and helping those algorithms because I'm like I want to see more of that content, right? I want to see them succeed. I want them to see them get ahead in life. I want to see that little YouTube placard on their back that says that they have a million viewers, right? And I'm like, you know, let let's do this. Whether it's watching, you know, cultures in Japan or or wherever. You know, and just seeing how they 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 live their lives and be appreciative of that. So, 
I don't want to erase something just to make sure that I'm naming it. And I was, you know, when, and, and it was related to your second question, right? Uh, your question was, how would you contrast racial identity and experience between Venezuela and the U.S.? And, and I wanted to make sure that, that I, I mentioned this, which is the, the race, the constructs, the construct of race, right? The question, what is your race that is in every form that you fill out here, right? That it was created for to keep that the caste system that is in the US. While in, in Venezuela and I know in other parts of um, uh, Latin America, there is the colorism, right? So I don't want to minimize that the, or, or trying to you know, wash out or don't mention, but yes, so there are colorism. There is colonialism. There is that part when you, you know, mejorar la raza or improve the race, you know, and get your hair straight. And um, the, our pageant, pageant queens are mostly, you know, fair skin compared with darker skin. They're all of that and in the media, right? But there is a difference between the colorism and the caste system. And just, just wanted to point that out. Jennifer, heads up, I'm, I'm, I'm adding you back into the conversation. How do I do this? Oh, wait. I'm here. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Hey, I did it. Um, <laughs> I heard my paycheck for the day. Um, so, um, Gosh, a lot of things, a lot of, you're getting a lot of love in the chat, y'all. Um, and so I, I, number one, let me just say thank you. This is a lot to like, it's, it's, it's challenging to get up on this stage and share and like spill your guts and talk about your, who you are and where you've come from. And um, thank you. It's, it's really brave, um, right? I think in some ways uh, doing this over Zoom can be easier, but in a lot of ways it can be more challenging because you know when we're all in a room together, at least you know you 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 can see you you are connecting with people, and I can see that in the chat. Um, and um, whew, yeah, um, and now I'm blanking on what I was going to say. I will say too. I mean, I, I'm pretty fair skinned most of the time in the Pacific Northwest, but that 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 lack of sunshine really um, <laughs> was was a, a common thing I've seen in, in um, the chat again. Um, I'd like to, to uh, if you're if you're okay with it, I'd like to um, open this space up if any of our um, attendees have questions or, or comments that they'd like to share. Um, you know, the, I, I, we're, we're going to go a little bit into our, our trial time to, to connect with people, but I think this is important. A lot of people are connecting with it. So um, I see Maria's uh, raised her hand. Um, oh, and Maria, I saw your comments about continuing this conversation. I, I'd encourage you to check out our, our DEI committee, which meets the second Thursday of the month, I believe. Um, we'll, we'll share some information about that, but that's a good place to have conversation too. So Maria, please. Thank you. Um, so if you can see my picture, I'm wearing a baseball cap. Um, and that is because as a Latina that went to college and became a certified public accountant and financial expert, I thought I was safe in America from police brutality. And during the pulmonary embolism, they took me down the way they took down Eric Gardner. And, I, and then they locked me up in the mental health facility because I wasn't drunk or on drugs, so I had to be mental. I couldn't have a physical condition. I, in October of last year, retired from my profession because my public health district governing board declared racism a public health crisis. And I'm getting paid less now than before I finished college because they pay 
crap for equity work. That's how much they value it. They'll talk about how much they value it, but they don't pay the people doing the work for it. So I probably should have said that <laughs> because, but I didn't say where I'm from, right? So that's good. Um, and when I get triggered, when, when, when my PTSD gets triggered and I don't sleep, I haven't hardly slept for two weeks. I'm working remotely from work because not only was my PTSD triggered from Irene Nichols' vigil that we held in our community that was actually organized by law enforcement, I also have CPTSD. And someone that saw me at that vigil, I forgot to take off my badge from work and they accused me, or not, not really accused, they did. They accused me of being hateful, angry, and divisive. And if they hadn't been because the chief of police from the town that I'm from had a relationship with me because he, when he heard my story two years ago, he helped me heal and he was there. And other law enforcement, when I reached out and said, hey, someone's calling HR because I was accused of being this. And they sent me a beautiful email at the very bottom. They said, send that people to me, send, send whoever said that to me. Some people don't know trauma, they only know drama. And I'm gonna stick with that every time I get triggered because a lot of times I've internalized that so much that I'm being dramatic, right? Because Latinas, what are we? Every soap opera, we are dramatic. And if we're angry or upset, we're just angry Latinas. And we don't have a reason to be angry because it's not as bad as, bad as a black person's experience. And I think that's really unfair when we start saying that any one of us has it worse. We all have it bad in one way or another. And so having this conversation, I came in here mid conversation because I said I was triggered. I've not slept for since January 30th, more than three hours a night with prescription drugs. PTSD is not a very well understood um, illness. It's got a lot of stigma. CPTSD is barely getting traction. I've never heard about it until I read Mark Charles's book um, about, uh, I can't remember the name now, but anyway, um, I'm sorry, I think I'm just rambling, but you have no idea how much healing this conversation had on me right now. And I'd love to be on that committee. Right. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, this, these conversations do bring up a lot. And um, uh, I, I can tell you, um, without sharing too much on my end, that that, that sleep component is, is in itself, you know, a, a, a huge hurdle and, and challenge to face, too. So I hope that, um, you know, I pray that you get a good night's sleep soon, because um, it's, um, it's amazing how healing that can be. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna drop just so we don't forget it. I, I, I feel like I'm self-promoting too much, but if you, uh, the email to, to contact us and, and find out more about committees and whatnot is uh, lln at ofm.wa.gov and we can help get you connected so you can um, participate in the, the DEI committee or any other way with, with us. Um, I'm gonna turn it over next to Katrina. So you raised your hand and then uh, Angela uh, next as well. Hi, um, I did have a question for all three of the panelists, uh, just because as someone, I'm a mixed race Latina. So my mom is Afro-Cuban, my dad is Quiche Maya, he's indigenous uh, and living in the Pacific Northwest. It took me a minute to find my people. So I wanted to ask if there is a sweet memory you ha you've had and what like, a situation where you were trying to find your folks or your people that you could be culturally immersed in or any sort of reintegration or reconnecting with your uh, community, your culture? I can answer that. Um, one of the experiences that I've had multiple times is what I like to call little lost lamb syndrome. So people will find out through natural course of discovery um, that I'm adopted. 
And when that information has surfaced to um, any Boricua or New Orican I have ever met, they literally claim me and go, oh, honey, you don't know anything about yourself. We'll teach you. <laughs> the first person to ever do that to me, no lie, because uh, I don't blow smoke, was Tito Puente's wife. Because I used to go to school with Junior and Audrey. And so I went home after school with Junior one day and we're sitting in the kitchen and his mom comes in and they're talking back and forth in Spanish. And I'm just going, what'd she say? What'd she say? <laughs> and of course, and, um, she, you know, she, she looked down upon me and, and she held up my chin and she went, Mija, it's going to be okay. We're going to show you who you are. And it's happened so many times. I have a bunch of, I have a, a gaggle of loud mouth Chicago, Puerto Rican friends. And when I met them through a uh, business, they said the same thing. And now I'm going to say something. It's not very nice, but it's said to me by my people with love and affection. They go, Aw, it's okay, honey. We understand that you're getting washed. We're going to teach you what to do. <laughs> really what they want to say is Italian washed because the skin is not a nice word, but I understand where they're coming from. And uh, I just find that really, really interesting. So I'm still learning. And uh, I mentioned to Tony earlier that um, all the self uh discovery and, and reflection and introspection has um, prompted me to actually take my ancestry DNA test. Uh, so I should get those results back and uh, I'll keep y'all posted. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, I, I kind of like, I met Senator Nobles before when she was the CEO for Tacoma Urban League. And there was a, a um, at the Tacoma Art Museum, uh, my, my daughter was working there at the time and they had a, a um, uh, it was during uh, Black History Month uh, and they had this uh, ex art exhibit. So I said, let's go over there, you know, cause I want to go and I want to participate. And that's where I met her. And that kind of led to other in, uh, relationships. Um, but it's, I found that seeking those, um, those connections in, in those types of environments, whether it's a museum or, um, some other, you know, um, uh, organization that's putting forth kind of uh, uh, an event. Um, in my role now as the DEI manager for DFW, I'm I'm engaging our communications team to says, hey, listen, we need to stop going to these white neighborhoods. No offense, I was like, but we need to focus on these neighborhoods of colors, these communities of color. I was like, we already have that demographic on lockdown, right? We got white people fishing and hunting left and right and, and hiking left and right. I said, let's go to these communities of color. Cause in, in, in a way it's a bit self-serving cause I, just, I still want that connection, right? I still want to be with my people. So it's a little bit selfish of me but it's also as a way to kind of understand where most of the need is, is needed, right? And, and we can't wait for them to come to us. So I'm, I'm seeking them out left and right. I'm, I'm thirsting for them. And, and this, this interaction with Jennifer and Indira and everyone here on the screen is just like making me more thirsty. You know, I want to go to that well and I want to keep drinking. And uh, for me, Katrina, thank you for that question. It's, the, it's through music and dance. Okay? For, <laughs> it's very simple. Uh, I, I find a group of people through uh, um, Cielo, which is a nonprofit here in Olympia and uh, for Latinos. And through then I have met many, uh, many four from different uh, countries, right? That we then identify Latinos and all of that is part of my identity. One time they invite me for a, oh, let's meet up for, for dancing on a Saturday at 10 a.m. in a Tai Chi place. <laughs> so it, it's not like a <laughs> dancing in a nightclub, you know, nothing like that. And, and each of us brought our own music you know, and then we were just connecting and dancing with ourselves. And I was dancing with me and each person, you know, and that is a, is a, is a memory, uh, a cute memory and something that, you know, centered me with my folk. No, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. Um, 
So I'll, I'll share that, um, you know, at our, at our last Hispanic Heritage Month kickoff event, we, we did feature dancing in Miller Sylvania State Park. So we, we hope to do that again. Um, you know, I've got two left feet, so I, I, it was helpful for me to learn a bit. Um, um, also, can I just say something real quick? So as an adoptive parent, if you all could do me a favor, if you meet anybody else that is, has a family built on adoption, don't tell the parent how lucky that kid is because the parent is, is really the, the lucky one um, in that scenario. And it's something that I know that a lot of people say with good intent, um, but it's hurtful. And um, you know, I appreciate Jennifer for speaking up about her experience as a transracial adoptee. Um, yeah, I just want to take a moment of privilege to say, hey, your good intent is there, but cut it out. <laughs> Don't say it. So uh, thank you, Katrina, for your question. Um, Angela, I'm going to, you got your hand up, you're next. Thank you so much. Um, I'm this, I hate to take a, a different direction because so far the conversation seems so festive, but if I could just offer just a little bit of pushback on some of the things that I think I've seen in the chat and some of the comments that were said. In particular, it has to do with tanning and uh, I think suffering. So one, I think it's critical to recognize the realities that Afro-Latinos, Indigenous Latinos uh, experience because as particularly uh, for those for whom there is no slippage or ambiguity, there is no lack of tanning. Uh, as far as that, there is no sort of whitening past a certain amount. Um, I think that case system is definitely present in Latin America. There are charts that map it out very explicitly and words uh, that describe it. So I think when we share the suffering, uh, I think non-Black Latinos uh, experience, I don't think it's a matter of saying one is prioritized over the other. But I think it's critical to understand the way white supremacy converges with other systems of oppression uh, on Black and Indigenous people as the primary targets of that ideology. And that Mestizaje as a project in the process of blanqueamiento deliberately seeks to erase both. So I think I just wanted to kind of name and acknowledge that, that both of these populations are less likely to survive under that system of oppression. And stating that doesn't diminish the suffering others experience, but it does recognize the reality that um, I don't think any of us should be ignoring, especially in this work with diversity, equity, inclusion. So I think I just kind of wanted to put that out there. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that's an important that uh, you're speaking to the heart of it. And um, uh, yeah, I think it's important to call that out. I appreciate you calling us in on, on it and, and speaking to it. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, the panel members, like, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share in, in, in terms of that? Yeah, I think at least from, from my perspective, it's it's really difficult, right? Because there is that where, where we're, Another additional identity I have outside of, you know, as Dr. Johnson calls it, my earth suit, right, is the identity of wearing the cloth of the nation, right, and how that kind of intersects with what I'm seeing in the country, you know, that I shed blood, sweat, and tears on, right, seeing my brothers and sisters and non-binary loved ones kind of um, at the, at the, under the foot of oppression as it kind of explodes in, into the ether um so it's 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 very real right and i think that as being able to call that out right and to say that yeah you know i served in the military but i also acknowledge the fact that the military um uh, was a part of genocide um and and continues to to do that right and i think it, it's being able to like like you said Angela, is is being able to kind of call these things out right and saying hey let's not let's not forget and let's not get it twisted, right? That these things are still prevalent and they're still out there. I mean, when I was serving, there were still, you know, um, people putting swastikas on, on, the, on the doors of, of, our, of our barracks rooms, right? 
the army had to outlaw the use of Doc Martens because that was the primary footwear of white supremacists, right? So if you were a, a soldier caught wearing Doc Martens, you, you'd get, you know, in trouble, right? Um, and now fast forwarding to January 6th and seeing, you know, veterans and active duty soldiers participating in that kind of, you know, behavior, it's like, you know, we have to be vigilant, like, like Angela said, and, and, and keep that at the forefront where people's lives are literally at, at risk. When Trayvon Martin happened, my wife forbade me to be walking around in a hoodie in, 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 at night in, the limp, in, in uh, DuPont at that point. She was like, I don't want you wearing a hoodie. And it's like, yeah, I, I can see why. Well, and I, Angela, I, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, thank um, I, um, Angela, when you, um, you know, thank you, thank you for calling us out or in, right? Whatever you want to put it. Um, yes, I, I, I decided to, to talk about me and the way I, I try to see life, right? It doesn't negate the other. And that's one of the reasons why I say, hey, I want to mention colorism, right? Um, um, because I was worried that I might sound too light, OK? Uh, light in the, in the words. When, Larry, you're saying your wife prohibit you to you wear hoodies at night, I mean, I pay attention and I am always a hyper alert wherever I go. And uh, recently, I went to a concert where the majority of people were very, very white. Um, there is a, a term for that that I don't want to use. Uh, but I was very scared of just being there because I was one of two people in the room that was not white or light skin, blue eyes, you know, have the American thing, right? So it was not political, it was music and it was like country music. So, um, so I was afraid, yeah. So, um, yeah, so yeah, I I'm going to stop there, thank you. When, so, so I was gonna say too, I think, you know, a big part of this is, is the, one of the conversations I've seen over the last year or two has been around acknowledging, you know, colorism and racism within the Latino community. Um, I, I, Larry, I'm pretty sure it was you wrote something really beautiful about, well, about an ugly event, you know, the, the um, Los Angeles City Council and the, the just gross racist things that were said by council members there. And, and you know, we, we can't look past, we don't get a pass uh, on, on these things because we're, we become part of it. And that's again, you, as Angela said, you know, all around the, this whole white supremacist or white dominant culture piece, which, um, you know, isn't isn't even necessarily like like that word white, I think is, is unfortunate in itself because it, it smushes down the, the differences in cultures around, you know, European culture and all these other pieces too. So it's like, it, it's this flattening that we see. And, and I think that's, you know, some of the stuff that Indira touched on in coming to the US is that we, we lose a lot of that. And, and that's, on, that's been on purpose by, by the people in power with these things. So um, really thank you for, for calling us in. Um, we're, we're coming up towards the end of time. Jennifer, did you have anything you wanted to say regarding that though? I wanted to, to give you a moment too. Um, the only thing I wanted to say is just to uh, try and keep things in perspective. And what I mean that is, um, I had mentioned earlier that when someone meets me, because depending on maybe how my hair looks that day or how my makeup looks that day, um, there are times when I can look more Black. There are times when I can look more Indigenous. There are times when I can look um, more Latina. But we don't see the world. We see the world as we are. We don't see the world as it is. 
So you can't, so more often than not, because we're all narcissistic, we're the center of our own universe, right? When somebody's like, oh, wow, like I can never do that. Well, right. You could never do that because you just told yourself you couldn't do that. <laughs> so when it's, it's very difficult to be everything and anything all at once, when somebody is telling you who you are based on their experiences and their knowledge. And that's just not okay. It's not okay in the workplace. It's not okay in everyday life. Before I came to Washington state government, I was an entrepreneur for several, several years. And as my business started to fade, I went back into property management. I managed section eight housing in the worst HUD property in East Bremerton. And that property was filled with brown and black faces, but it didn't stop the residents from literally defecating. Someone dropped their pants and defecated on the front door on my second day of work. The door was littered with sticky notes calling me the N-word and telling me to go back to Africa. And the incidents from the residents went on and on and on because they lost their mind because they saw a black woman in charge of their world and they couldn't take it. So just remember, people see the world as they are, not as it is. So you just have to take a step back and try and flip the script. That's all. Okay, well, th so thank you everybody for your, your questions and comments. Um, we, we, we ended up, um, we were going to do some Charlotte breakout rooms, but I think we ended up doing a, a big breakout room. Um, I, I know, um, again, thank you to our, our guest panel. And I know it can also be kind of courageous to, to put your hand out there and um, ask a question or make a comment too. So I wanna say thank you again to um, our question askers and commenters. Um, so we're gonna take one of the questions from the Charla and ask the panel um, to, to um, I'll just tell you what mine was gonna be. Um, so what what song is currently rocking on your playlist? Um, I was going to say mine is Un Verano Sin Ti, you know, just album in general from Bad Bunny. Um, but what do you, what do y'all what are y'all listening to at the moment? And then we'll we'll, we'll close up with an, our, our final announcements. I already told you who I was listening to. I'm listening to Celia Cruz. <laughs> la vida es la carnaval. Um, you know, I'm just so excited. Like I said, she's one of my sheroes and, and the fact that any woman, regardless of what color they want to call themselves, winds up on U.S. currency means it's a good day. So, so I've just been celebrating um, my salsa because what can I say? I'm from New York and that's what we do. <laughs> we do salsa and we do it real well. Yeah, and let us know in the chat, you know, what y'all are listening to uh, in, the, um, in the membership as well, because I'm always looking for, for new stuff to listen to. I have to say, uh, the Super Bowl got me, got me back into my girl, Rihanna. I mean, she did fabulous, was looking fabulous, baby bump and all. And I had to look at my... Baloncito Viejo, Carlos Vive and Camilo. This Colombian and um, Mexican together. So that's what it is right now in my playlist. Okay. Um, let me go back to figure out how to share the screen. I'll also share with you all, um, I don't know if you listen to the radio anymore, but 99.3 plays some excellent banda music. Um, so, okay. And quick, I always feel like such an old person when I'm clicking around in Zoom. Okay, uh, so if you are interested, we have a, a bunch of different committees um, with the Latino Leadership Network. Um, we have our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee uh, that's led by Jovita Ramirez and Steve Camerer. Steve was did the introduction uh, for our meeting today. Uh, and they meet on the second Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. Um, if you're interested, please reach out to Steve or Jovita, or you can email us at the LLN uh, group email. Um, 
We also have a health and wellness committee uh, that's led by Angela Roque and uh, Zenaida Rojas. Uh, Zenaida was the one who, who uh, Monica was reading her notes earlier. Um, they've got some really cool stuff that they're working on. Um, you know, potentially maybe a, a hike in the outdoors. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, we also have a best practices committee. It's in a little bit of a hiatus because I was previously leading it and um, now I'm the chair, so I haven't had time to um, do both. But um, I'll share with you, one of the things we've been working on with it is the, um, the Federal Office of Management and Budget is lo looking at making revisions to how they their federal um, race and ethnicity standards. So this is the data that they use on the census or the boxes that we get to check. Um, so they're looking at making some changes and improvements on that. Um, and part of that is they're holding listening sessions. So we're working on setting up li a listening session because um, your voices, your experiences are important. And um, yeah, they got some work to do on improving that census. Um, it's getting better each time, but um, it's, got, it's got room for improvement still. Um, and then we have uh, an events group uh, committee uh, that's, uh, if you're interested in that, um, contact Sedona Lisa. Um, or you, again, you can contact us at LON at OFM if you're interested in helping out with the Hispanic Heritage Month kickoff events. Uh, again, looking to y'all on the east side of the mountains about maybe putting something together for that. Uh, and then um, you can sign up for, let me start over. Um, one of the best ways to find out about our events or news that we're doing um, is to sign up for the Gov Delivery. Um, for, so that's what the QR code is there. Let me see if I can um, drop it in the chat as well. We've got people dropping it in the chat, Tony. Oh, thank you. Um, and so, also a reminder for everyone that if you haven't signed in yet, please do so that we can continue providing this wonderful content for everyone. Yes, um, I would say go into that Gov Delivery, even if you already signed up for LLN and click all the boxes for the other business resource groups. That way you can find out what Larry's got going on with the Veterans Employee Resource Group or Build or uh, Happen, which is the newest um, BRG. Um, you will find out about so many different opportunities for professional development or connection or how to write your resume, all those sorts of things. The business resource groups are doing great work. Indira's key partner in making all that happen. So thank you again, Indira. Um, and then, I, yes, and you can follow us on LinkedIn. Um, we have our YouTube channel, so you can go back and watch past events, um, or if you want to rewatch this again. Um, and I think that is all we have on the slide deck. It's 4.59. Um, let me just say it again. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you to our panel guests. Um, this is always really stressful to put on, but I, I, I just feel such a great connection meeting with you all. Um, that's one of our goals is creating that sense of community. If you have thoughts or wanna be part of LLN and help me make that happen, please reach out. We'd love to help you. We love having you at these meetings. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna stop recording. Um, Tony, I'd like to add, um, I, I really appreciate all of the love that you gave the panelists today. It takes a lot of bravery to be able to speak about some of these things that affect us so deeply and for so long. So I appreciate the panelists. Thank you for sharing your stories and helping all of us feel included and showing us that we all belong here. Um, and I want to thank everyone that attended today. Um, it, it's, a, it's not easy to find time to come to these meetings. Um, and we need you to come to these meetings because you are why we're here. So as, as grateful as we are to our panelists, we are just as grateful for those that attended today. So thank you for coming. All right. All right. Well, until next time, adios.